Mm. Welcome to the seventh episode of Double Bell here, season eleven recaps from Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Harmstone, and joining me as always is the Canadian who we describe regularly as Mister Know It All, but wouldn't recommend you let him teach your kids, Logan Saunders. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You're not feeling a hundred percent, and to be honest, neither is Bindles. Bindles has got COVID. Yeah, then yeah, there's something. Uh, there's definitely something going around because I know a few people who are feeling sick right now at the start of spring. Yeah, keep away from me, given I'm going to Belgium in four days as of the time of this recording. Well, it's a good thing I can't afford to go on a trip right now. (laughs) It is. When this comes out, in three days' time, I will be talking to the final three, hopefully, and seeing the finale early, and lamenting the fact that I don't get to speak to Ruben. Maybe you'll speak to him at the after party. Yeah, that's certainly the plan, but yeah, that was my overriding emotion when I found out this morning that Ruben went, because... Annoyingly, I forgot to warn Bindles that I was going to be watching it today, so his suspicions spoiled me this morning. I went, oh, who does that mean? Oh, fucking hell, Ruben's gone. What? How did that happen? <laughs> I know, as soon as he posted the suspicions, I quickly averted my eye, so I genuinely didn't know who went home. Yeah, I didn't mean to, but I meant to I meant to tell him that I wasn't watching it till today. But, I mean, it's it's such a fantastic way for him to go out. This episode was nuts. Just... This season was very, very well planned out. Yeah. I know we'll talk about this a lot in in two weeks' time, but this season has just been utterly phenomenal, and I cannot wait for the finale next week. I cannot wait to inevitably have Papa Bear Gilles de Costa cackling my ear again if it's not Lancelot. If it's not Lancelot, boy oh boy is that going to be a shocker. That would probably be one of the biggest surprise endings of any season. How many times have we both been, have we ever both been wrong for Belhia? Um, have we both been wrong? I don't think we have. Because when I originally watched Argentina and South Africa, I was wrong. We were both on Peter for Mexico by the time that we uh, we spoke to Jill, at least. Vietnam, you were right. I was wrong with Papa Virgil de Costa Cacca at me. We were both on Alina by the end of Greece. Uh, I was on Lenny. You were on Sven for Germany. Yeah. And then last year, you were on Uma, I was on Jens. Yep. So you were right there. And then, yeah. So we've never both been wrong on Belkia as a result. I will say it's not a clean sweep for all three of us. Bindles is still on toast. Spoilers for the end of this episode. I just can't see it because of how much money he has earned. And whenever I expect him to earn money, he does. He's never in the position where the most money is lost yet every episode. It's always Ruben and Lancelot. And now it's just Lancelot. Yeah. So yeah, in summary, if you've got any questions for the final three, now we know who they are, please send them over to us before Sunday afternoon, because assuming it's the same setup as Vietnam, I'll be in there from about two o'clock on Sunday afternoon local time. Are you going to call them by their cowboy names? I might do. The problem is, like, not going too behind the curtain, but when we went to Vietnam... We did end up having some DMs with one person in the final three, so we had a connection there of some description. I've not spoken to any of these three, so I don't know whether they've listened to the podcast. I don't know whether they're going to be amenable to our brand of bullshit. (laughs) It's going to be a very interesting experience, because obviously if they listen and they know that I like to joke that you're a deviant... Maybe they have their own bingo sheet. Yeah, then it'll be fun. (laughs) If they turn up with their own bingo sheet, I will laugh my head off. The problem is, it's the great unknown of this. I have no idea whether anyone from this cast has been listening for the first time in years. For the first time since Mexico? Well, Germany we definitely did. I don't know if we did for Canary Islands, but we we never really thought that we were going to be talking to anyone from Canary Islands, I don't think. Or I certainly didn't. Vietnam, we definitely did. Obviously, we knew Bart. Um, was at least tangentially aware of us. So, excluding Canary Islands, it is the first time since Mexico that I've no idea whether anyone from this cast is actually aware of us. I suspect they might be. I wouldn't be surprised if I get recognised on Sunday. Or at least by voice. (laughs) Everyone else is speaking Flemish except for you. Yeah, but I don't know for certain. I mean, I'm I'm happy that I'm going in a season where everyone definitely speaks English. So the warnings of, oh, this is the English guy we've warned you about, will be helpful, and they probably should be okay actually speaking to me, hopefully. Yeah, everyone seemed to do fine. Uh, as long as you don't use the word insight, apparently. 
<laughs> I am I'm not gonna lie, a little bit gutted that I'm not gonna just have five minutes to gush over how hilarious Ruben's been this season though. I wonder you should give him a boot full of rocks or a hat full of grasshoppers. He was the one that I was most looking forward to talking to and just going, Do you realise how fun you are at reacting to things? <laughs> so yeah, send in your questions if you if you've got anything you want me to ask the final three, I'll see what I can do. On the subject of people sending stuff in, though, we have had two very interesting pieces of information in the last week. One on Instagram, one on YouTube. I apologise to anyone who's commented on YouTube. I did realise that for some reason the auto mod was holding comments, so I've approved all the uh, all the good ones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know which one you didn't approve. <laughs> yeah, the one I didn't approve, well, that one actually auto approved itself and then immediately got reported to YouTube because we did have a trolling comment on an Amazing Race Canada episode which was incredibly rude and also wrong. I like how it's been, what, five years since season five aired, and this, and, uh, this person, who we have no idea who it is, just decided to troll us out of nowhere. Yeah, this is the thing. Like, They replied to a comment that I put up five years ago about a team <laughs> who, let's be honest, during the season, we weren't the biggest fans of. We made that abundantly clear how much we thought they were very irritating and had the season rigged towards them. So the comment was something innocuous like, oh, I'm just glad that they didn't win. I'm glad that Sam and Paul won instead. But instead, they just were incredibly rude. It was it was this morning, I think I sent you guys that, that image, mm. wasn't it? And the other thing I thought of was, somebody's watching season five of Amazing Race Canada right now. Yeah. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I think that's the season where you can tell that I have completely hit a wall with this show. You started out the because I listened to the first couple minutes. I'm thinking, was there something right at the very beginning you said that really pissed off the person? And at the beginning, you say, This will be the last ever, ever, ever podcast for Amazing Race Canada. Last season we're ever covering. <laughs> yep, because the first episode of that season, the, uh, the cast preview was episode 200, and I regretted it immediately. I regretted letting you bully me into doing that season. So I put oh, se- season, f- season five. Yeah, of season five, that one. Um, because the only reason I know that it was episode 200 was because the episode title was still 50 more than New Canada. Oh, right. Because that was I forgot they did the whole 150 theme that season. Anyway, back to this season. There's one comment from Instagram and one comment from YouTube that I do want to um, to pull up. The one from YouTube is from Kurt, who says that Van Bull is there as a liaison between the candidates and production because after last year they wanted someone who knew what they're going through as a sounding board for the contestants. So that answers our question from last week about why Gilles Van Bull just suddenly appeared in production. So um, nothing to do with his fluency in English? Nothing to do with his fluency in English. It was purely so that they basically have a, a therapist, I suppose. He acted essentially as a mole therapist. And I say a comment on Instagram, it was um, a series of DMs from Kata, and I did warn her that I was going to uh, talk about this, because I was already sort of circling on talking about this. But she said, Hey guys, long message incoming, but it's about your theory on the dates of filming and the weather, because I also listen to your colleagues from Trust Nobody, hopefully I'll see those guys at the weekend, because they're lovely, and one of their listeners pointed out an error in this season regarding the dates. We all know that the newspaper they received on day 9 was actually the newspaper from day 10, meaning that day 9 was November 5th and day 10 was November 6th. But extra footage is now online where Gilles receives dog treats for his birthday. According to the listener of Trust Nobody, this was filmed on day 14, and Gilles has his birthday on November 17th, meaning that either the newspaper date was incorrect or they celebrated Gilles' birthday on another day. On top of that, people have found that on the alleged first day of filming, based on the newspaper October 28th, world-famous actor Matteo Simone was seen at a premiere of some sorts on that day, meaning he couldn't have been in Arizona, and if Gilles' birthday was celebrated right at midnight, so going from day 14 to 15, it means that day 15 was November 17th, meaning that my weather theory was correct all along. Oh. Yeah. So you basically missed all this fun, but I did speculate when Bindles was on the podcast that that you could work out what day one was based on the weather, and then when the newspaper came along, that kind of disputed everything that I'd said about the, the date. So it turns out, in the end, it looks like I might have been right. You're right all along. You were sabotaged by production. Yeah, pretty much. Two final bits of housekeeping before we actually get into the episode proper. Bindle's suspicions last week were to Ruben, Lancelot, and Comfort in that order. And the final question, because I've not asked it, how has your week been? How has my week been? I'm trying to think. It's been, yeah, the weather's getting nicer here. Started running again. 
And then, yeah, then I woke up with a sore throat uh, yesterday morning. Yeah, and then I had these weird dizzy spells a few days before that, so I don't know what the hell is going on, but... Oh, and I went to trivia. Oh, that... <laughs> This, this, is this I haven't talked about since the last podcast. So we record on Tuesday, right? We do, yes. So I went to Trivia on Thursday, and it's that newer venue I've talked about that has only been around for about five months. And usually, on average, it's about five teams for that one. So it's the smallest in town, but sometimes they'll get up to eight or nine teams playing, but usually no, no fewer than five teams. And we went on Thursday and I thought, oh, I don't feel like going just because of uh, personal stuff that was going on with uh, with another friend. She's going through something right now in the community. So everyone was bummed out thinking, oh, we don't really want to go to trivia. And I thought, ah, screw it. We should, we'll, we'll go to trivia today. Got to, got to get out of the house. So convinced uh, there were four of us who went together as a team to trivia. And when we showed up, there was only one other team playing that day. <laughs> it was a one versus one trivia showdown. <laughs> a team of four versus another team of four uh, in the whole restaurant. So essentially you had a trivia duel. Yeah, it was a duel, yeah. It was one versus one, that was it. So usually the winning team gets fifty a $50 gift certificate and the losing team gets nothing. But I think because there were only two teams... They decided to give both teams a $25 gift certificate. Maybe they were thinking, oh, if we give the winners 50 and the other team zero, we might only have one team come back to play next week. I would have said, fuck them, we're doubling it to 100. We play for keeps. <laughs> it's all or nothing, losers. Supposedly, if the other team wasn't convinced to play, since we were a team of four, we may have had to split into pairs and just do a two versus two trivia game in the whole restaurant. What they should have done is split it again, so it's one versus one versus one versus one. We, yeah, it, it, it was almost one versus one if the other team hadn't showed up, and if the other couple that occasionally comes to trivia for for our team, they 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 come about a third of the time. If they hadn't shown up, it would have just been me and my friend playing one versus one. I guess. <laughs> I don't know if the host would have even bothered though, with only two people playing in the whole restaurant i think even with four people if they had to force one team to divide into two versus two i think even at that point they probably would have said no because the restaurant probably doesn't want to give out fifty dollars worth of gift cards when there's not that many people inside the restaurant that night yeah i mean the whole point of doing stuff like trivia nights is to try and bring people in on a night that's normally quiet yeah you're not going to make much of a profit if you're giving out fifty dollar gift cards when there's only two teams there. Yeah, that was that was hilarious because I've never seen it. I've, it's always no matter where I go in Vernon, it's always five teams or more that play trivia. And I think no, a couple times it's been four teams, but definitely not three, and definitely not two teams playing. Yeah, and another follow up to something we discussed a uh, a couple of weeks ago. I've now officially moved into Homestone Heights. Oh, so you're actually all settled in your house. You've got everything you need. I am. This is the first podcast coming from my brand new desk with my brand new microphone arm. That means that I don't have to have a weird ad hoc situation to actually balance my microphone anymore. Yay! And you're, are you in a busy neighborhood at all, or is it a really quiet area? It's absolutely quiet. Having said that, I do have a, a video doorbell and uh, about three o'clock this morning as it was. Um, because my the way my house is set up without doxing myself too much is that my front door's kind of around the corner. So I have a, a video doorbell for that um for that reason. And about it's about two minutes past three this morning I got a notification that I ended up seeing when I actually woke up of a guy walking past my door and then going down the hill in front of my house. And I thought, what was that about? And then about twelve o'clock this afternoon I got a text off the, the site manager of uh, of the estate saying just be aware, because there was a guy trying um, car doors um, last night. Oh, he was trying to break in. Yeah, there was, then he sent me a video of, of someone else's doorbell of this guy trying car handles to see whether they were unlocked or not. And I said, oh, he seemed to have walked past my house at two minutes past three and then sent him my video. So yeah, I seem to have, on night one of moving into Harmstone Heights, actually, um, actually moved into an area that has a bit of a crime problem, it seems. 
Maybe just the one guy, right? Yeah, I, th- I think it was the one guy. I'm, <laughs> I'm exaggerating for comic effect. The crime stats are significantly lower than uh, than where I've moved from, but it is kind of hilarious that on the very first night since I moved in proper, there is a potential crime happening. 100% of the, of the days you've been living in that neighborhood, you've been burglarized. Yeah, exactly. Or attempted. Attempted burglary. Luckily, my <laughs> burglar alarm did not go off because it is the worst noise in the entire world. Oh yeah, even worse than Dumb and Dumber? Oh god, it's awful. I was up here a day or two after getting my burglar alarm fitted a couple of weeks ago, and my dad rang me as I was just about to go for a walk, so I was only a minute away, so I turned around, and while talking to him on, on my headphones, I turned the alarm off. He said, what's that noise? I said, it's the, uh, it's the burglar alarm, you've not heard it yet. It's awful, even when you're just turning it off. <laughs> But um, it sends a really horrible noise to my phone as well if uh, if someone tries to break in or if any of the sensors detect anything. So I do not want that in the middle of the night, especially at like two minutes past three as it was this morning. No, that would really suck. And we did discuss it last week, so I'm going to bring up the bingo card again because friend of the podcast of Fuzzy Orange did delight us once more by trying to guess what was in last week's episode and the nine squares that were chosen where Logan, quote-unquote, knows the hidden sign between the mold and the puppet. Don't think you said you did? No. Uh, Logan steals Lancelot from Michael's team, Michael steals Reuben. That did not happen. You, I think, were slightly tempted to steal Lancelot, and let's be honest, in retrospect, you probably should have done. But I would have never stolen Reuben. It was always going to be Thomas if I was going to steal anyone, I think. Uh, Reuben eating donuts as Savannah. Sadly not. You were close. It was another Reuben one, but it wasn't that one. Uh, Michael's never been roller skating. Unfortunate pick. Didn't say it in the episode, but I actually have never been roller skating because I'm 6'5 and a liability. <laughs> Logan's Mucky Videos is the centre square. I mean, that's a standard. It always happens. Mm-hmm. It's like Luppy Goldberg. Good laugh at the horrendous photo of that one Prime Minister. You know the one. We did not mention any of the Prime Ministers because we steer away from that sort of stuff. Both predict Comfort will go home next week. We did guess and we were wrong. Debate over the identity of the mole just based on the responses to the candidates in the taxi. You can kind of claim that, I think. Yeah, we used to loosely yeah, talk I, about that. I, I mentioned the fact that Lancelot didn't get a hello, which is potentially a clue. And the final square is one that I definitely want to bring up because I know your answer to it. No one likes lemon meringue pie, which is a potential food sin. <laughs> I don't think we've ever mentioned your love of pie on this podcast. At least oh, not I hate pie. Mold. Jesus Christ, I hate pie. At least not for Belgian Mole. I know we've discussed it at length in the past, but Logan hates pie with every fibre of his being. And yeah. um, I don't like citrus-based desserts. So yeah, that would have been an absolute home run if we'd mentioned it on the podcast. But we didn't. Yeah, I'd probably just suppress the sight of the pie in the episode. So previously, the scum arrived as Reuben and Toast played pranks to try and help Lancelot teach. The Mole enlisted a puppet to try and drain the pot at a diner, while Comfort and Reuben tried to stop a bomb on a bus blowing up. However, it's Thomas's chances that went up in smoke as he was the sixth person sent home. And we begin with an introduction to the final four in a Western style. Ruby the Kid is the youngest of the group and can't tell the difference between green and yellow. Trigger Happy Toast has a big mouth and can't tell the difference between an S and a J. Crazy Colt Commie is Little Miss Perfect, except when there's money on the line. And Sundance Lance is Mr. Know It All, but you wouldn't trust him to teach your kids. I doubt even his mama trusts him. None of them can be trusted, but only one is a saboteur. They all look suspicious as hell. I loved this entire (laughs) theme for the episode. We made no secret of it when we did Germany that the bomb dinner was one of our favourite things. And this was just a delightful takeoff of the bomb dinner again. Yeah, it was essentially narrated by Sam Elliott. (laughs) <laughs> and the best thing for us is the fact we didn't need subtitles for this. Easiest challenge to understand ever. <laughs> yeah, half of this episode was just easy as pie for us, appropriately. <laughs> yeah, because there are a lot of English tongue twisters. If uh, Even if we didn't have subtitles, I think we would have perfectly understood every challenge. I know we speculated that production have slightly pandered to us this season with some of them, but the tongue twister thing... We've literally had an episode title called The Tongan Twister because you were doing tongue twisters in that episode. <laughs> it's the most pandery we've ever had. 
Yeah, then to have the majority the majority of the episode be spoken in English and have a Sam Elliott narrate as opposed to Jill made things a lot easier. Yeah, I mean, keep this up for the finale, please, because that will make my life so much easier when I'm in the press room. And then they uh, they use the theme song from the Netflix show, Ashton Kutcher's Netflix show, The Ranch, which, oddly enough, also stars Sam Elliott. And the episode title is You Must Be the Fastest Gun in the West, That or Biggest Liar from The Quick and the Dead. Have you ever seen that movie? I have not. Neither have I. We've previously discussed the fact I don't watch films unless they're Marvel ones. I've never even really heard of it. I wonder, I wonder who's in it, out of curiosity. I presume it's a Western one. Yeah, I, I would assume so. Oh, Sharon Oh, it's the main one. Okay. Sharon Stone, Gene Hackman, Leonardo DiCaprio, and Russell Crowe. I was going to say, I'm assuming it's one that was filmed in Mescal. Has a Rotten Tomatoes reign of just 58%. Ah, oh, we've all been there. Yeah, we've got Super Mario Brothers. Isn't that higher than than 58%? I know, it wasn't a fresh tomato when I saw it in theaters. Maybe more critic reviews have come in to boost it, but it wasn't a fresh tomato and you need 60% to be a fresh tomato on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, the critics have been miserable. 59%. 59%, yeah. Jinx, buy me some Coke. Uh. <laughs> I'm certainly not buying you the weird Pepsi that you got obsessed with. Oh, Pepsi Mango. I was just talking about that uh, yesterday. No, two days ago. Two days ago, I was talking about Pepsi Mango. Pepsi Mango, Pepsi Vanilla. Uh, what's the one I had in Hungary? Have you ever had Vanilla Sprite? No. I haven't, I haven't come across Vanilla Sprite anywhere. You know the Coke Freestyle Machines? No. The the like the the self service Coke machines where you can pick whether it's Coke or Sprite or Fanta or whatever and, and then you can have like flavoured shots in them as well. Oh. And one of the options is vanilla Sprite, which is the world's sweetest drink. I had it when we were in Vegas, which was I mean, nearly ten years ago now, Jesus. Um we're recording this on the second of May and I was in Boston ten years ago today, the first full day in America. But yeah, we had it when we were in Vegas, and it is disgustingly sweet. Oh, too sweet, like Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. It's horrifically sweet. So it's day 16 in Tucson, and Comfort wakes the boys up, and Ruben nearly pours coffee on Tosi's head from the top bunk, because for some reason, they are in bunk beds. (laughs) With four people left. Yeah, the three guys were... It was weird because... It, It was weird because... Like, Ruben had the top bunk, and then it looked like Lancelot was on bottom bunk, and then Toast was kind of on the bottom bunk as well. I presume the bottom bunk was a double bed, which is just a weird setup. Did they want it that way for a sleepover or something? Were they staying up all night playing Nintendo 64 games? I mean, to be honest, if you had the option of a separate bed on the mole, you probably would go for it, or I certainly would. Maybe they all want to keep an eye on each other? Yeah, I would never want to share a bed unless I absolutely had to. Yeah, unless they were engaged in a sexy pillow fight during the night. I I don't understand. I know that you are not the first podcast host for RTV Warriors who has imagined Ruben doing a sexy pillow fight, but still, Saunders. Get your head out the door. (laughs) Who was the other person, Davey? Bindles. Oh. (laughs) Yeah, have you not seen Bindles' thirsty tweets about about Ruben? Uh, I don't think so. So Ruby the Kid is the most rootin' tootin'est thirst trap for Bindles? Yeah. Just call him Thirst Trap Ruby. And Jill tells us that when everyone wakes up, they are driving further into the Sonoran Desert to Mescal. But first, they have to stop off at a western shop to get kitted out for the rest of the episode. Why didn't they use Sam Elliott to come up with a nickname for Jill da Costa? Can you imagine him saying, and they are, and they join up? With the host, the rudeness tootin' at host, Papa Bear Jill da Costa. If they had done that, I would have lost my <laughs> shit. <laughs> and then you'd have people saying, oh, they are not pandering to you, it's just a coincidence, Michael. I think that is the point where it goes from it just being headcanon for us, that they're pandering to, us to full on, yes, this is pandering. <laughs> that could have been one of the roadblocks for... For Lancelot and Reuben is just, oh, the guy who was driving the coach, he says, oh, there's a 
there's a bear blocking the path, and it's just Jill Acosta in a, as an actual papa bear in costume blocking the path. <laughs> but yeah, if they had done a full-on papa bear reference, like you could only imagine the cackling that I would have done. <laughs> and I was thinking too that uh, they didn't play Wild Wild West by Will Smith at any point during this episode. They didn't. Wiki Wiki Wild. I'm guessing they didn't reference Will Smith ever since he turned into a humongous asshole, though. Yeah, yeah. I I don't think that they on this fun-loving television show would really want to sort of hitch their wagon appropriately to the Will Smith ride. Yeah, and I mean, you know, you know, your reputation has really gone downhill if they're willing to reference Russell Crowe, but not you. Yeah, it's awkward. <laughs> Oh, if 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 Jill DaCosta dressed up as a bear, somebody could have played Leonardo DiCaprio and wrestle him. Are you trying to get me to reference <laughs> that that story that you never knew about that film? <laughs> Go back through the archives, listen to listen to the one where we referenced the Revenant and how Logan didn't know the internet rumor about that film. So yeah, when they're at the Western shop, uh, Lancelot picks a hat and it's definitely his color, but not his size. And I am wondering whether they put that in the episode because there were lots of comments when the cast photos came out about the fact that Lancelot has the only hat that is definitely not his size in the cast photos. Hmm. I'm wondering whether they deliberately left that in the episode as a result of it. Yeah, just a hidden, it's a hidden clue. And I mean, even if, even if I didn't know that Ruben was going to get executed going into this episode, like the fact that he picks a white hat and all that sort of stuff, we... Spoilers are going to be discussing this in the first Historians of the Year, because I've just edited that episode, about how you can Ooh. tell whether a contestant or a team is good or evil based on the colour of their stats when they're in a western lane. Because we've referenced it previously on Bidham Oregon when they did the country theme season. But yeah, weirdly I'd finished episode 10 of um, of the Amazing Race Historians that were going to be releasing spoilers at the end of this month, where... They do have a western theme leg, and you can tell which team is the evil one because they're wearing the black hats. Mm. There is a, a callback to Oregon when I said that exact same sentence for their finale and who the mole actually was. Adam and Day. Yeah, spoilers, it was Adam and Day. I don't think it's any secret that we're doing Amazing Race Australia 2. We did say we were going to do it last year. It is our first historians of this year, and this is the exclusive it's going to get released beginning this month. I should note, somebody was just uh commenting on my Mace Race Canada 9 predictions blog where it, it turned into a discussion about race across the world and yeah there's people who really want us to do that for historians at some point. I mean it's certainly not out of the question. I am as you might have been able to tell from last week pretty obsessed with the Canada theme series but of course there have been two previous to that so we're gonna have to maybe go back through the archives a little bit more if we do want to do race across the world at some point. I really want to do the first season just for the infamous ship episode. My parents have just watched that episode because they were reluctant to watch anything they call Sku, some crap or other that I watch. But they've had enough people talking about it where they finally kind of relented and gone, mm, go on then, we'll watch it. And yeah, they, when I left yesterday, were, uh, were watching episode five. So they just got past the infamous ship themed episode. And I did warn them that, you know, how can it last eight weeks for them to do six episodes and I'm just thinking, well, six days of that is spent on a cargo ship in the middle of the stands. <laughs> yeah, the ship dropped anchor and they almost ran out of food. So yeah, to that person who's commenting on Logan's blog, um, we'll take it under advisement, put it that way. It's certainly not a no. So Jill meets them in Mescal at a film set that's been used in over 100 productions, including The Quick and the Dead, and he tells them there is 8,000 euros at stake, and that they will be responsible for the post. Two of them will take care of postcards, while the other two will collect the mail. They decide that Lancelot and Ruben will collect the post aboard the mail coach, and each post bag they collect is worth 400 euros for the pot. One bag isn't worth anything, though, but is super valuable later if they collect it. And Comfort and Toast stay in Mescal to make the postcards. So in other words, when I saw these pairs for I'm thinking, well, really the pair should have been renamed the pair that will earn money, and the pair that won't earn money. And the pair that will both sabotage no matter what. 
<laughs> where one guy has been trying all season to pretend to be the mole at every possible opportunity, and the guy who we're fairly certain is the mole. And the challenge played out exactly the way we thought it would. <laughs> we have previously referenced the fact that when I'm writing questions to the suspect list, I try and make them as even prospects as possible. But I've done exactly the same thing this week as I did for the episode that went into the final three for Venom, in that if you want to select Lancelot now, you have to pin your colours to the mast, because I've deliberately done a split where Lancelot is the one, and the other two are the two. So if you think it is Lancelot now, you have to select him on the bonus. You have no buffer anymore. Because I did the exact same thing with Yora and Venom. It's time! It's time to actually put up or shut up, and if you think it's Lancelot, you have to select his team this time. Which side would you have rather done? Not necessarily as a contestant or mole, just as a... If you had the option, which one would you have done? Uh... As the the stagecoach one. Yeah, I think I think that is more fun, at least, collecting the post. Yeah, fun little minigames. You get to throw some knives, like you're playing multiplayer in uh, 007 Goldeneye, or if you're Jam Jam from Survivor 44, 00. <laughs> yeah, given your coordination skills, though, I'm not sure I'd want to trust you with throwing knives. <laughs> well, just, you know, wear body armor. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think any crew member would be particularly vulnerable if they let you have knives. Yeah, everyone's like, okay, everyone, put on, you know, the metal pants, jock strap, body armor, and a helmet. Okay, Logan, throw. Okay, Logan, you're up. <laughs> yeah, so that, that would be fun, throwing knives. Yeah, and I mean, I can't really talk too much, given that a few months ago with work, I did do axe throwing, and I was an absolute liability. If it was reversed with American contestants having to identify Belgian provinces, how well do you think they'd do? Zero. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> do you think the four contestants that they studied a little bit on American geography before filming this season? I mean, you'd hope so. I did see the... I don't know if it's a complaint. I did see the point on Father's Bar's Discord earlier that Actually, those six states are probably the most well-known of the 48 contiguous in terms of their positioning. You know what I just noticed on the when you Google the Super Mario Brothers movie? If you entered that into Google, the, the, there's a question mark block that flashes next to the next to the Google search. Yeah, I just noticed that right now. It was right as I was going to type in Belgian provinces for the hell of it. <laughs> How do you think you would have done? With naming Belgian provinces? I think if, well, A, if I knew I was filming a season in Belgium, I would be studying up on the provinces. But if I hadn't studied at all, I think I would be able to figure out at least a couple of them. Especially with an answer bank and knowing where the German region was, the French-speaking region, the Flemish-speaking region, and you got Brussels as its own district in the center. I feel like I would get a few few correct answers on the board there. Yeah, I mean, obviously both of us would have absolutely aced the US state version. Oh yeah, no question, yeah. I even know Mimmel. I don't think both of us would have aced the Belgian provinces version. <laughs> necessarily. No. But yeah, both of us are, I would say, pretty confident with this sort of stuff. How many states do you think they knew? Because we only see Lancelot and Reuben get Texas. Do you think they were not 100% certain on the other 49? I think if they're most likely to have done any research, they would have probably known the ones surrounding it. So they they had California, I think, as one of the options in there. So they probably would have known California. You think they would have gotten Arizona? Was Arizona one of the options? I can't actually remember. Yeah, Arizona yeah. was one of the options. Production took it easy on them. Yeah, I think they probably would have got Arizona. I think they probably would have got California. Texas they obviously did get. I'd like to think they would have got maybe a Utah and a New Mexico, because they're next door. Anything, as soon as you get a bit more eastwards, you're probably into more dicey territory. Florida and Hawaii, do you think you, they would have gotten those two? Florida or Florida, Hawaii, Alaska? Well, I don't think they did anything that wasn't in the contiguous. 
Oh, they only did the lower 48. Okay. I think it was lower 48, yeah. So, yeah, they'd probably get Florida. It would have been hilarious if production trolled them and it was Vermont, Kansas, Nebraska, uh, Maryland, Mississippi. I mean, I'm I'm a geography nerd and I would have really struggled with some of those. I wouldn't be able to play all 48, I don't think. They, they certainly wouldn't. So the post collectors have an hour to collect all 10 of their bags, and they can earn more money if they manage to return to Mescal within the hour, which should be doable, as the journey takes half an hour without any accidents. And they also notice wanted posters hanging in the coach, with six tongue twisters on them. And through this, we learn that Lancelot went through speech therapy as a child. I went through speech therapy too, and I feel like I would have done better on the Flemish tongue twisters than he did with hours of practice. How did you do with the English ones? What were the English ones? Uh, she sells she sells. We had uh, how much she was sells the seashells shell? by the seashore. What was the other one? I think I think it was three Flemish ones, three English ones. Yeah, probably just Rachel Riley's job titles. Yeah, I was going to say I can't really talk much given how much I always, always, always mess up the Rachel Riley job titles. I got through them once, and that was when Bindles gave me a gimme set. So I don't think I would be the best person to talk about this. I'm terrible with tongue twisters generally. So the Flemish sperm whale one seemed to be the toughest of them all. Yet that's the one that Lance a lot, very much wanted to try over and over again. Yeah, this is the thing. Obviously, we both suspect Lancelot is the mole. The easiest sabotage on this challenge is by far being confident, going for the hardest possible one, and then just accidentally messing it up at the end. Yeah, and then Reuben missed the word uh, for the Flemish radish tongue twister. And then, because Lancelot said, oh, I don't want to do the English ones. The English ones are going to be too hard. Just stick with the Flemish ones. But then he chose the longest Flemish one possible out of the two, because there were two bandits at a time, right? And he just always went with the harder one. Yeah, this is the thing. If you always go for the harder one, then it's much more likely you're going to lose. Because I suspect, without looking at the pair's in great detail that there was an easy one and a hard one or there was an English one and a Flemish one in each pair. Not to mention you get fewer attempts on it because of the 20 second timer. So if you choose the longest one, you only get two attempts at it. Yeah. So Comfort and Toast can also earn money by recreating postcards perfectly. The camera will automatically take a photo after 10 minutes and when they're trying to do the first one, which is Toast sitting there cross-legged with a chicken on his head and Comfort on a hammock, she falls out of the hammock, and apart from it, goes missing. Yeah, they really pulled a Twilight and Chris from Survivor Vanuatu with the hammock breaking. Yeah. It was almost Albana was just her lying on the ground just going, what the fuck happened? But I thought it was a bit too obvious, so I thought I'd challenge people to guess what the banner was this week. I've not gone for that one. And then I like how they had a random woman in a rocking chair holding a chicken. Like, where where are we going to find a chicken? Oh, from that woman there in a rocking chair holding a chicken. Where else would you get your chickens from? (laughs) It seems perfectly logical to me. Yeah, of course. Somebody's lap that's on a rocking chair on a porch. Of course they're going to be holding a chicken. It's like having a child on your lap. She's the Santa Claus for chickens. So Ruben and Lancelot find their first roadblock to win four bags and to be able to keep going. All they've got to do is match cliches on Ruben's board to Lancelot's signpost full of themes. For each saying they complete, they can saw for one minute to clear the roadblock. They get six minutes of sawing time in the end, and the number of bags that they collect is determined by how deep a groove they want to saw. They choose the deepest groove for one bag, and with more than three minutes on the clock, they cut through the log. Too easy. I thought a roadblock was only a task that one person may perform. Yeah, this was an intersected one, though. Mm. And then, I don't know if this was a translation error, but after they collect the one mailbag, Lancelot says, kiss my balls. I don't think it was a translation error. I think that's just how he spoke. Yeah, he did say he did want his testicles kissed while they're doing this mail-carrying task. And this is the person everyone was wanting to share a bunk bed with. And this is the person who, let's be honest... Spat mustard over a robot. <laughs> I thought it was mayonnaise. I wasn't going to go for the low-hanging fruit of saying mayonnaise, <laughs> so I went for mustard instead. Well done, Saunders. 
Yeah, it was quite the hot dog eating contest there too. That episode, spilling of spilling all that mayonnaise all over Joey Chestnuts hot dogs. So Ruben is also allowed to ride up front with the mailman as a result of them completing the challenge. He's riding shotgun. He is. We find out the origin of the term riding shotgun, which was actually very interesting. Makes a lot of sense. With less than two minutes left, Toast finds the chicken and they begin to recreate the picture. The photo takes, but they will only see the result of their efforts in the evening. Tease. The stagecoach begins being followed by bandits, and they can only be repelled by shouting tongue twisters in their faces. Ruben gets 20 seconds to shout one of the tongue twisters, and if he fails, the bandits will steal a mailbag. He fails on both, and they are back down to zero bags. He couldn't do the wristwatches one, and he couldn't do the radishes one. That was the other one. It was the Swiss Swiss wristwatches one. Yeah, we're going to have you do the picture, the postcards, I think, Michael. Yeah, I think that's probably wise. For the second postcard, one of Toast and Comfort needs to stand under a pouring shower while the other flips a pancake. And for the second post challenge, Ruben and Lancelot must use throwing knives to hit envelopes with the names of American states on them. If they pierce an envelope, they can try and name where it is on a map to earn one mailbag per state. Lancelot quite logically suggests Texas as it is a big envelope and he knows exactly where it is. Nothing's bigger than Texas. Nope, apart from Alaska. And after many a shot, they get Texas and earn one mailbag. Yet again, they end up leaving with just one bag, and Lancelot rides shotgun this time. Toast and Comfort take their picture, but they weren't sure if it was right. And Toast then tries the pancake, and it is utterly revolting, and he spits it out. Yeah, I think they're going to have to delay the conclusion of the season by a day so Toos can get over his food poisoning from the pancake. It did make me laugh that Toast said at one point, Oh, I wish Ruben was here so we'd actually get nice pancakes. Yeah, Ruben. We don't even want to earn the money. We just want the nice, fluffy pancakes that Ruben can make. The bandit in a fairy hat then appears, and Lancelot repels him with a well-timed tongue twister. The last photo is of the four of them with two bandits in the background, and is worth 2,000 euros for the pot. I thought with the bandits that you could just repel them by saying, Expecto Patronum. No, it's uh, Avadicadavra. Just kill the bandits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> through the speaker about a cadaver oh shit we took out the driver too damn it it is one way to ensure the bandits get repelled i mean it, it's a bit of a permanent repel but it's it's certainly one way to repel them any means necessary that's how we do it in the wild west and they can get the attention of the bandits by shouting howdy folks like they're on <laughs> big thunder mountain <laughs> and reuben also delights me even further by acting like a very irritating child on a road trip, essentially asking Lancelot, are we there yet, are we there yet, are we there yet, are we there yet? Are we close? Don't make me turn this coach around. And they arrive with six minutes to spare and begin to try and take the group photo. Lancelot lures the bandits and Toast takes the photo, but they still have to repel the bandits or lose another bag. Lancelot fails to correctly say the pisspot tongue twister, and they lose their only bag again for a total of nothing of 4,000 euros. Around the campfire, they then burn the Tucson Today paper from episode 4, just like we did because the dates were wrong on it, while Comfort serves them appetizers, and apparently her tuna salad was made with love, and I'm pretty sure they would have preferred it if it was made with tuna. Yeah, and she probably drugged it as well, that's why Ruben was executed the next day. Gilles then appears and has had the postcards printed, The first one was right, but the second one wasn't, as neither element was in place in time. No shower, no pancake. Just like me on Saturday morning when I'm going to the airport. And the third one is also good for a total of 3,000 euros of 4,000 from their side. And he asks Lancelot for the valuable mailbag, and it contains letters from home. But they just had the family visit. Yeah, but this one didn't feature pictures. You can't really hold up pictures of your children in... uh... Oh, when you're blindfolded? But they had the whole date afterwards. Yeah, but it it doesn't hit the same if you have to hold them up to a robot screen and tell Lancelot to stop humping it and tell Thomas to <laughs> yeah. stop squeezing Lancelot, its Lancelot, there's other family in this room. This is a family program for a family visit. Yeah, my in These are your future in-laws, buddy. Please stop humping the robot. <laughs> <laughs> the start of all relationship problems. Just like the Napster episode of Futurama. And of course, this being a television program where there are letters from home, there is then a 20-minute segment of all the bullshit of family things. Oh wait, no there isn't, because it's not an American show. They do one minute on it, and then they move on like they should. 
And I like how with the two pairings, we knew who, who was going to earn all the money for the task. That was all twos and comfort because they even were giving out helpful hints to each other to make the pictures better. There was no attempt to try and sabotage any of those photos by the two of them. Yeah, I don't think it was a surprise if you'd have told me that one team earns 3,000 euros and one team earns zero. I think you probably could have picked which one it was going to be straight away. Yeah. And as Bindles put it on the bothers of our Discord, God, I appreciate a show that gives the cast letters from home and doesn't spend 20 minutes getting trauma porn reactions from them. Everyone's obviously suspicious of what happened in the mail run, and Comfort says that Lancelot always takes crucial roles to screw up. Almost like he's a saboteur. Yeah. So the country voiceover returns to introduce Day 17 as everyone walks into the saloon, or maybe it's the salon, depending on who you are and whether you can pronounce the word saloon. And we find out that he's actually playing through the speakers in the saloon this time, like it's the Germany bomb challenge. The voiceover tells us that they could earn €6,000 in the final challenge of the episode. Also, and perhaps more importantly, one of them called in a Vrastel and Opta Finale. Everyone basically confirms that they will take the Vrastel and Opta Finale. Apart from Toast, Lancelot says he will only go for it if someone else does first. Earlier in the morning, they practice sliding whiskey glasses to the edge of a table with five attempts each. The person who did worst now has a €3,000 bounty on their head. As well as rocks in their shoes. Well, yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. But all they have to do to earn the money is to send the right player to the duel and have them lose. Did you know it was Ruben straight away? Not straight away, but I took note. I figured it out when he walked to get the whiskey glass, because he was walking different from everyone else. Yeah, obviously my opinions on this episode are skewed by the fact that I knew that Ruben went home. But Reuben proved himself to be a terrible liar in this episode, as he says towards the end of the episode himself. If I was ever in any doubt that Reuben was the mole, I don't think I would have suspected him this week. I wonder if contestants never really suspected Reuben on location because of the tales we're able to see in this episode due to there being increased focus on each of the four contestants, so there's more tells that we can get tipped off from Reuben. And maybe that's why he went home this episode, because no one has been suspecting him for a while. Yeah, I think it's very interesting looking at my suspicions as I was earlier, because when it's the episode before the finale, I prepare all the documentation and stuff for the finale as much as I can, like the suspicions, graphics, and all that sort of stuff. And Ruben went off a complete cliff for me about halfway through the season. And it's really interesting, because he after the first episode, was my second suspect. The only reason that he wasn't on my team straight away is because you stole him. In any other situation, I would have probably had Ruben on my team. And it's fascinating to see the point where Ruben stops being suspicious to me, and where he just starts being a really entertaining character who's obviously a little bit inept, and sort of just leans into it. And it's it's about week three or four, I think, where Ruben just massively crashed out of my suspect list. Yeah. Uh, Thomas said during the last execution, I said, I've written Ruben off for a while, but maybe I should start looking at him again. So we even had insight from contestants who said, I, well, I don't suspect Ruben anymore. Yeah, I think Ruben always seemed a bit more suspicious than he was because he was always in the more suspicious groups. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference, is he always seemed to be paired up with people who were just a little bit more moly than he was, and it, it rubbed off on him. I mean, like the first challenge in this episode. He was paired with Lancelot, who is obviously by far the most suspicious of the final three. And as a result, you kind of go, maybe Reuben could be the mole just because he's a bit more suspicious than, than Comfort and Toast are as a result of that challenge. How do you think you would have done with sliding the glasses? Out of interest. Um, I think I would have overshot on the first couple. I think I would have done okay. Yeah, because the strategy is actually very interesting. These four people are all actually quite good at it. They're far better than you would expect them to be with five attempts. Because I think I probably would have played it a bit more safe than a lot of them did. I would have tried to get one on the board just so I had a score in the hope that somebody managed to smash all five glasses. But I think they actually did quite well. I mean, 
Toast got it within five centimeters, I think. That was that was ridiculous. Yeah, it's a very impressive <laughs> performance. So Lancelot claims his personal best was zero centimeters when it was actually thirty five and a half. And the voiceover pushes Reuben to tell his personal best, and he lies. Just for fun, the person who did worst has lots of little stones in their boots, and now they have to walk to the bar to get a drink. Not only do they walk, but they also all jump to prove a point. And Lancelot claims Reuben's shoes rattled as he walked. Do you think the mole knew who who was the worst each round? Yes. Just because the shoe rattling, that wasn't the reason why I picked up that Reuben had rocks in his shoes. Or a snake in my boot. The reason I ask is because it's a very interesting tactic from Lancelot if they did. Because if he is the mole, you don't want to suspect the person with rocks in their boots. Well, yeah, you do, because then you want to be in the duel with the person with the 3,000 bounty and then intentionally throw the duel. Yeah, but also you would prefer to put someone in the duel who's worth zero. Because the situation that he engineered here is that Reuben gets voted for, so there's a 3,000 euro bounty, and then he gets picked by Reuben as being the second worst, and he's correct. So they're guaranteed to have some sort of stakes. As soon as Lancelot fingers Reuben, basically. How unpleasant. Whereas if you can direct the conversation towards someone who's done better, then you're guaranteed a zero in there, and the worst case scenario is still that 3,000 euros goes into the stakes. Unless you just want to say, hey, I prevented, single-handedly prevented 3k from going in the pot. Yeah, I don't know. It's a very interesting tactic from Lancelot if he is the mole. Unless he just wanted to make sure the votes weren't on him for the duel? I don't know. That's the thing, if the votes are on him, then he's worth a thousand euros, and then he just picks one of the two who's worth zero. Yeah. That's the better mole tactic. That's true, yeah. Why pin it on Ruben, then? His worst case scenario is Ruben going in. And maybe it was the case that he realised that it was going to be a situation where Comfort and Toast voted for Ruben regardless, and we don't know what the tiebreak mechanism was, but I don't think I would have chanced it in his position if he's mole. Unless there was a twist where somehow you earn more money if the two people with bounties made it to the final two of the challenge? I don't know. As a mole, you want some sort of stakes for the final round of this challenge, but you don't want those stakes to be very high. Because you know that there is a very good chance that the fastest person to draw is going to hit the, uh, the money ring because it was so massive. Oh, right, yeah, the targets... Yeah, the order of the target was it was a massive ring of money, a pretty small ring of the exemption, and then the bullseye was the group exemption and the money. Right. You don't want anyone getting the group exemption necessarily because it's potentially worth €6,000, but you also, more importantly, don't want to be putting too much money in the pot. And Lancelot plays this badly as a mole if he's mole, because he loses all of his control by letting Reuben go in and potentially loses €3,000. Yeah, and then he has no control over that final round. Unless he wanted to take himself out of the equation, let the three actual players have a shot at the final exemption. No pun intended. The chances of money going into the pot from this challenge is very high. The chances of someone getting an exemption are not. Yeah, it's tough to, it's tough to figure, yeah. I think the mole wants control in this challenge, and if it's Lancelot, he didn't get any control. He allowed himself to be led. By a vote of 3-1, to one, Reuben is voted in. He does indeed have the rocks in his boots, and also toasts his whiskey. The player with the second worst score is worth €1,000, and Reuben can send them to duel with him. He chooses the Lancelot and is correct. And the winner of the duel is the person who fires first, and the loser's money will go into the stakes of this challenge. Reuben walks back in, and they add Lancelot's €1,000 to the stakes of the challenge. I'm glad Alec Baldwin was nowhere near this challenge. Oof, too soon. So the second challenge was to light as many candles as they could in the sheriff's office in three minutes. The matches need to be lit using the back of their boots. And the worst performer is yet again <laughs> worth 3,000 euros if they lose the duel. I didn't even know this was a thing. No, neither did I. How do you think you would have done with it? I think I would have done terrible. Yeah, like, <laughs> this is not a skill anyone has, surely. Yeah, striking matches against cowboy boots, that's not, that's not a common thing in uh, Flanders. Who uses matches anyway? Use a lighter, like a normal person. The the outback of Flanders. <laughs> or light a candle <laughs> using a gas hob, like a normal person. You don't use matches anymore. 
It's it's very film noir. It is, but like no one has matches. I guess Sam Elliott does. And I like that they made them vote using old school playing cards too. Oh, I am hoping and praying that there are some playing cards at the finale that I can have. But I obviously want all of the merch that isn't nailed down. I want a Bryce Delling, I want any yokers that are available, but I would love some of these old school playing cards. They could make a full deck of just Belhia contestants at this point. 54 cards in the deck, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think how they would do it, because obviously you'd need you'd need 13 characters, I would say. So presumably you'd do the 10 from this season, including world-famous Matteo Simone, but then there's still three. One of those could be Gilles, I suppose. It'd be tough. Willie Summers would have to be one of the Jokers. Obviously you would put Papa Bear Gilles de Costa as the king. After that, I don't know who you would put on the mole playing cards. There hasn't been anyone named Jack, right? No, not that I can think of. So Toast claims he lit about 40 candles when it was actually 32. And the worst performer has grasshoppers under their hats. And <laughs> Sam Elliott jokes that they might be mating by this point. <laughs> they might be mating at this point, you never know. Comfort suspects Reuben again, as it was the hardest task for him because of his height. Comfort picks Reuben, but Toast and Reuben pick Comfort. Her hat is empty, and yet again, it was Reuben who was worth 3,000 euros. However, she does pick Reuben to duel with. <clears throat> we get some Nancy Sinatra playing, too. We do. These boots are made for walking, but they are not, in Reuben's case, made for striking matches. I was going more for Bang Bang, but... Yeah, I know you were. <laughs> yes, yeah, I know. <laughs> I would have said Jessica Simpson otherwise. <laughs> yeah, it's a good pun, all right. <laughs> so Toast leaves the salon to find Reuben once more. He confirms his grasshopper hat and that they might have been mating. And Comfort was worth a thousand euros. To earn the money of the Bryce Dillon, they need to shoot a target. The outer ring's worth the money. The inner ring's worth the Bryce Dillon. And if someone gets the bullseye, they will earn the two thousand euros and a group Bryce Dillon. The fate of the group is decided by whoever hits the target the fastest, and they will only know if it's all four of them going to the finale if everyone gets a green screen at the execution. They structured this so damn well for this final four twist. Like, even though I knew Ruben was going, I knew exactly what they'd end up doing. They would leave him for last, they would give him a red screen, and it would just be that knife in the gut. That throwing knife in the gut. The size of Texas. It's so good. And so unbelievably nasty a way to do it. Because when the first three get green screens, as we'll talk about in the next couple of minutes, first three get green screens, and Ruben's like, oh, that means I'm out. Oh shit, no it doesn't. There's still hope. So they they allow him to believe that he's going, then give him hope, and then crush him again. It's like he got executed twice. Yeah, he gets as crushed as the grasshoppers that were under his hat. But as soon as execution happened, I thought, whoever gets executed has to be left for last for that suspense, and it's still that 50-50 shot, again, no pun intended, that they all got the group exemption there. So as soon as Jill says, oh, we were going to put in the two losers first, and I thought, well, that means neither of them are going home. And then Twos was entered in, I thought, group. Ex I was leaning towards that the group exemption was going to happen. And then, bam! Kapow! You just got Alec Baldwin. I mean, obviously, Vidim is much bigger on the group exemption than Bell here is. But it's so clever the way that they played with the group exemption here. And how they actually gave it a bit of intrigue. Because usually when there's a group exemption involved in Vidim, we know exactly what's going to happen with it pretty much straight away. Yeah, we know they're buying themselves in an additional episode. Yeah, here they absolutely didn't need to do the group exemption. It was a really fun twist to the end of this challenge. But most importantly, they kept us in the dark. Vidim always tilts the table massively when they want it to be a group exemption round. And there's only that 5 or 10% chance that it won't be a group exemption each time. It's more of a shock if they're not exempt. There's always the Olche factor of it, of someone just going, no, I want money. There's not a chance we're doing a group exemption, I want money. And then here you've got, with Belhia, it's, you genuinely don't, since they don't like to do group exemption twists, 
and especially with how how they set up the odds here, you genuinely don't know. It, did Ruben have enough experience in the past two rounds that he'll hit the target? What's going to happen? And then you, yeah, you leave it to that very last name. If it's going to be a green or a red screen in Vidim, it'd just always be telegraphed from a mile away. Yeah, I think it's very emblematic of Belkia generally. And obviously, we'll end up talking about this in a couple of weeks, potentially, if it is confirmed as the last season for a little while. But it's very emblematic of Belkia generally that they treat us as one of the players as well. And that they keep us in the dark about a lot of these things and keep us guessing. Whereas Vidim treats us as an outside force, Belkia treats us as one of the contestants and actually makes us part of the game. And I think that is way better a way to do it than just giving us a little bit of professional distance. Yeah, in this episode, the well, the whole challenge, we got to play along with, oh, who had the rocks in their boots? And who looks like they might have grasshoppers <laughs> on their head? We found out the same time the contestants did. It's just one of them things where Belkir actually treats us in a much more intelligent way than Vidim does. Vidim treats us with kid gloves, Belkir treats us with grasshopper hats. And we we gotta praise Sam Elliott here. Where the hell is this strange voice coming from? The others look confused. Why the hell is Lancelot speaking English all of a sudden? I would love to know the brief for the voiceover artist for this episode. It's just like, <laughs> can you do a good Sam Elliott impression? And also, can you react to taking the piss out of Belgians? And also, can you say the word rice yelling, but in a country accent? As I said, a fabulous insight. <laughs> I'd also love to know the behind-the-scenes stuff of someone in production sitting Reuben down and going, yeah, we're going to have to fill your boots with gravel. <laughs> and your head with grasshoppers. Yeah, and also if you survive this round, we are going to have to fill your lovely clean steps and that you want to take home with you with grasshoppers. Is that okay? I'm surprised he didn't vote for himself that first round. So, it is now time for the test. 20 questions on the identity and actions of the mole. Whoever knows least will go home, except for the mole who can never go home. Those who survive this test will be in the finale. Lancelot is stressed because of the big question mark over whether everyone got the group exemption. Comfort thinks they might have gone for everyone in the finale. Ruben deliberately tried to go for all four in the finale. And Toast says if he could choose, that he would choose all four in the finale. What Ruben notices is that there are good liars amongst them. That sort of a challenge separates the good and bad liars, and it is clear that he's a bad liar. Lancelot says what Ruben did was the Moltrick of Moltricks. He can practice at home and make sure he wins a duel and comes back, earning less money for the stakes of the challenge. Comfort says Toast did the test a bit too well, and she thinks that he practiced. And Toast says the Mole definitely practiced, so they are worth less money. Gilles tells us that it's the last execution and also the most exciting. It was a day full of suspicions, duels, and heroism. The 2,000 euros was earned by the fastest to shoot, meaning they earned 2,000 euros of 6,000 for the challenge, 5,000 euros of 14,000 for the episode, and 22,320 euros of 89,500 for the season so far. Yeah, I forgot that he did the additional tease of, well, money was earned. He also confirms that no one earned an exemption individually, and that the question is now whether three or four of them will make the finale. Comfort, Lancelot, and Toast all get green screens, leaving Ruben as the difference between three and four. His screen, however, is red, sending him home at the final hurdle of the game. And he is visibly bummed out. Did, we didn't get to see the shot he made, right? Gilles did tell us that both him and Toast hit money. Oh, Just okay. Toast was a little bit faster. Okay, so they both hit the outer ring. Yeah, I think it would have been even more gutting for Ruben if he did hit one of the inner rings and was just a bit slower than Toast. Like but... 0.2 seconds or something ridiculous. Yeah, but Gilles does confirm to him on the way out that they both hit the same ring, so it didn't matter in the end. And he says he's extremely happy he made it this far, but it's tough to go home this close to the end. And his highlights were the stunt flying and the slack lining. Next time, the finale holds a mirror up to the final three. Toast goes live on air. And all is revealed in a cactus patch. Yeah, Comfort, Comfort's going to be on TV too. I mean, she already is, but... <laughs> I absolutely cannot wait. <laughs> I wonder if it's going to be like that whose line is it anyway sketch, where 
somebody has to pretend to be the news reporter, but they don't see what's on the green screen behind them. It's always my favourite of the Who's Line games, that. Yeah. So, for the first time in pool history, as a result of Ruben going home, I've completed the wipeout, as Lancelot, Comfort, and Toast were all on my team. I will also point out it is incredibly difficult to do the wipeout on Belgian Mole, because we start our teams with four or five people. It's only in, what, 10, 11 seasons of doing pool that anyone has completed a wipeout, and uh, yeah, this is the first time it's happened in Belgium. You lucky son of a gun. Yeah. I mean, my first thought was obviously, oh shit, Ruben's gone home, that's devastating for the season, I don't get to talk to him now. My second thought, and bearing in mind this was about an hour later, I went, oh shit, Ruben was Logan's last player, wasn't he? Get in! (laughs) I'm well aware that this sort of nonsense with the pool is incredibly one-sided, and like you and Michelle especially, well, Michelle does care, but you care a lot less than I do about this sort of stuff, but it really really made me laugh when I realised that I'd got a wipeout on you. Yeah. Bingo. Especially after last season. At least, well, you weren't the older bingo lady that got the that got the wipeout. Yeah, my first thought was, of course, I got it, motherfucker. <laughs> but especially after last season with Belkia, where you managed to um, get them all on your team both times, it's really nice to, like, guarantee it going into the finale that at least I get some sort of victory even if it's not Lancelot who's the mole I can still turn around to Papa Bear and go you can't cackle at me because I actually drafted the mole yeah 50-50 shot or 55% shot depending on which side you were How many did you get 5 or 4 this time? Uh, I got 5 but only because Sammy went home first mm. poor Steve Tao yeah it, it was a crapshoot who was going to get Lisa lot but Bearing in mind that Lisa Lot is the only person on my team who's gone home, basically since we drafted the teams. I'm quite proud of that. So, on first suspicions, with a perfect score of six, our leader going into the finale is Vidim icon Jan Kuiman. Only two people, Jan and April Bride 15, have a score in single figures now. And on the other end of the table, the highest score is 20. One point below that is Logan Saunders on 19. I'm currently on 11. Five people, you, Rowan, Sean, Alan, Ollie, and Logan, all had Ruben at number one. Wait, well, there's a Yeroen in our group? There is a Yeroen. It's a good Yeroen. Yeroen has actually been tweeting us today, so hello, Yeroen. I know you listen every week. Okay. I was like, I was thinking, oh, this could have been awkward really fast. It's not the Yeroen, because I would have got hate DMs by this point. He's hate playing. I'm going to show you how good I am at the mole by <laughs> doing these suspect lists. Yeah, I mean, if he was trying to show me how good he was at suspecting people, maybe this isn't the week to mention it when I say that Yaron was one of five people, including you, who had Ruben at number one on First Suspicions. Well, only one person, Walter, had him at number nine, which is quite impressive. And the order is, as it was last week, Lancelot, Comfort, and Tos, in that order. And as always, you can do the Bothers Bar suspect list each week at suspectlist.rtvwarriors.com or the link in our bio. And this is your friendly PSA, that if you have not used your Yoka, this is the final week to do so. Use it or lose it. Final section of the podcast, then, is the suspicions. I know who you suspect as the mole. It's Lancelot. Then a big gulf, and then everyone else, I suspect. Yeah, Lancelot, humongous gap, comfort, and then Toos. The bigger intrigue, I think, is who do you think's winning? Uh, how much did Comfort lo- learn from her elimination? I'm curious how the season is going to be received if she wins. Yeah, that's my next question, is basically, do you think it will dampen your perception of the season if Comfort wins? I mean, at least they did the bring back an eliminated player twist a lot better. This is the best version of the bring back an eliminated player I've ever seen. But it would still be that slight, yeah, she she won, but she was also eliminated. I'm sure Mole Story and Bindles will correct me on this, but I don't think we've had a winner be saved like this since Mole US 5. Oh, with, yeah. He got saved a lot. <laughs> I seem to remember he was saved by the bribe. And actually, the Mole um, mole US2 winner was also saved by the bribe. She definitely was. I know for a fact that 
Mole US 2 was. I think yeah. Mole US 5 was also saved by a bribe. And uh, the last exemption. Granted, that's happened in Belgia too, where the last exemption has dictated the outcome of the game. Yeah, but I can't think of a more recent example where the winner of the season would have or did get a red screen and then ended up winning. Yeah, it's the fact that an actual red screen was shown yeah. and then be brought back into the game and then have a 50-50 shot at winning. But yeah, it's going to be interesting. A, the reaction of Comfort wins, or B, the reaction if she turns out to be the mole. I don't think she'll be the mole, being honest. It's just, uh, there's no, she, we didn't see any major, anything that would point to her really being the mole, and especially the past few episodes. She's been uh, really far away from all the big sabotages. Bindles still thinks that Toast is the mole as well. He's got it as Toast, Lancelot, then Comfort, in that order. I think the most satisfying conclusion for most people for this season is two's winning, Lancelot the mole, and then Comfort being runner-up. If it's any other outcome, even if it, the other outcome is Lancelot still being the mole but Comfort winning, there's going to be a huge amount of discussion after the finale. Because the other, the other question will be, will production want a twist where somebody gets a red screen and potentially wins the game a second time? Because you can get away with somebody winning in a specific way once, especially a controversial way. Like Survivor having somebody come back from the edge of extinction and winning after only being in the game for 12 days. Or somebody coming back in from Redemption Island and winning the game. You can only get away with that type of victory uh, once each time. So with the mole, you can't, I don't think you can really get away with another person in the future getting a red screen, coming back, and then winning the whole season. Yeah, the other element of this twist that I did kind of flag at the time when we actually did that episode is the red screen thing contravenes Belhia law, but this episode also contravenes Belhia law in the fact that it's the only time they've ever given an exemption out, potentially, where everyone sits the test. Because usually they confirm the exemption before the test, and then that person doesn't sit it. Right. It's the only time there's been any intrigue over an exemption, and everyone has had to sit the test, even if they are potentially exempt from doing the test. And the other thing to acknowledge here is that if Comfort wins, re- I mean, really, who helped her? It was Lisa Lott and Layla that helped her, right? Yeah, they were the only two who helped. So... It's really on them that they got eliminated themselves for helping Comfort. If neither of them helped her, I think it's safe to say Comfort goes home that night. (laughs) I don't think she gets it with just the two free questions. And on top of all that, they were the next two to go home. But if you're you're twos, though, if you're twos are Ruben, you're thinking, well, I didn't help out Comfort, and she ended up winning the whole game. It was out of my hands. Counter argument, of course, to that would be you could have really pressured Layla and Lisa Lot to not help her if you really wanted to. You were too passive. You should have said if you really wanted comfort out of the game and not have a huge amount of information by coming back, you should have you should have pressured Lisa Lot and Layla and say no, you don't help her. What the hell are you doing? Because everyone said, oh, do what your conscience is telling you to do. A final interesting piece of information as well. Last week, production told us who Belgium suspected after six episodes. Rumours back to number one at 28.8%, followed by Lancelot on 26.7%, Toast on 24.5%, and Comfort on 20 dead. What? Still that many people suspect Comfort? Yeah, a fifth of people suspected Comfort. Exactly a fifth. wonder what it's going to be now that Rub- Ruben's gone. You think all those... Lancelot's got to be the front runner at this point for everybody. Yeah, Lancelot has only been number one once, and that was in the first week. And that was only borderline. He was 1% ahead of Ruben in week one, and that was it. Yeah, so I'll be I'll be flabbergasted if public isn't leaning towards him just like we are. Yeah. Have you got anything else you want to say? Uh, No, I think after an hour and a half, we really covered this episode. Given I'm looking at the clock going, fucking hell, it's 11.42pm. What are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> In that case, thank you for listening to our Demol Belkia Season 11 recap. We will be back next week to conclude the hunt for a new small in Arizona with a Diary of the Mole finale on Tuesday and regular recap on Thursday. That's all being well. Obviously, if I don't get to interview anyone, there won't be a Diary of the Mole finale. But the plan is Diary of the Mole finale Tuesday, regular recap Thursday. 
don't forget you can contact us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram where we are TV Warriors. I can email us and contact at rtvwarriors.com. Logan's on Twitter at Lugs of and I'm MJ Helmstone. You can also support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash rtvwarriors. See you next week. Peace out and just chill till the final of flavoring. Well, penultimate. We do reunion separately. Everyone knows what I meant. <laughs>